So uh, it's still good morning. So good morning. Um, we are very glad that you decided to join a talk about documentation, which is oh, uh, which is a very uh, unusual topic for technical conferences. At least that's what we, uh, with, together with Zbyszko, uh, believe. And while preparing this presentation, we thought about running it slightly as if it was a kind of documentation and include some principles that we believe are important uh, for any docs. One of those principles is too long, didn't read. So uh, we will be talking about documentation that is just in time, documentation that will appear promptly, so in right, right time, in places where you expect to find it, so right place, and with information you really, really need, so right context. Uh, if that doesn't suit you, that's a very good moment to leave, which we don't encourage. Anyway, whenever we think about documentation, um, it reminds me of, of this, this example. Uh, this is a rabbit, one rabbit. And when you have one more rabbit, then you have one plus one, equals two, you have two rabbits. And now, based on this very simple premise, we can build on and solve this equation. And this is very often how it works, or how it looks, how it appears to, to, uh, with documentation. Because we start with a very basic example, and then we land in a very complicated world we don't fully follow. And we would like to challenge that. We would like to, um, to see how we can do it. Better. And you might ask how this mathematical example resembles to, um, to coding. In a very simple way. We start with simple, we start with small things, we learn them, and then we build up, and we build up, and we build up. For example, you should be familiar with the stream interface. Regardless whether it's like monadic or non-monadic, every stream interface has these two methods, map and flat map. You know mapping converts one stream to another stream, well, the values in stream to another values, and flat map flattens a stream. That's fairly easy. And then you go to optional, which have the same premise. You find the same methods, you know what they are doing, you know how to, what to expect them. And then you go to completable future or completion stage, which is based on the same example. And then you have, then apply, and then compose. That doesn't work. We would like to change it. Uh, so let's introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Zbyszko. Uh, I always wanted to show my face on the big screen, so there it is. Um, I, am, I work in Dynatrace. Uh, I'm also uh, one of the organizers of the Tri-City Joke, which I highly recommend because it's the best joke in the Poland, of course, in the world. Uh, and uh, my name is Jakub. Uh, I work for an uh, online gaming company for Kasumo, but I also co-organize co uh, a conference called Seekfold. I work remotely, which you can judge by my cat photos on my Instagram page. So, Zbyszko, how it works for you with documentation? Okay, so I actually had a few interesting examples uh, among many First, uh, when it comes to documentation. First of all, when I came to a new project, new product actually, I wanted to see what the product is about. So basically, what I meant is to understand what are the principles of the product, what, is, what are its strengths, core strengths, what are the, its weaknesses, and so on. After a week, it turned out that I can actually go to the sales pitch presentation. That was the only place I can actually see uh, what the product is about or what the actual roadmap of it is. So, that was interesting because uh, not only it was very hard to reach, but also uh, it didn't contain the information I actually needed. Salespeople do not require such details about the, uh, about the product as I did. But once I actually got to work, I actually found out uh, what, uh, uh, what the product does. I wanted, of course, to code something. And once I hit my first roadblock, of course, I had to find out what the things are doing, right? What, the, what does this code do? What, uh, what does the service do? And so on. 
Of course, the only way of doing this is would to, uh, was actually to find the person who coded it or actually knows how it works. You start with the, you know, with the Git. You see the person who is uh, most frequently visible on the blame. And then you go to this person. It turns out that, of course, he, he or she doesn't do this for the last two years. So there is the next person, and then there's the next person. If you're lucky, you won't even, uh, you won't even go to a person who doesn't work any, any, anymore in the company. And if you're very lucky, you have architects or archaeologists or shamans, as you want to call them, which will have the knowledge. But you always, it's like finding the next person who may know something, right? Kuba, uh, any experiences that you had about this? Yeah, I, I recently was trying to find uh, a good picture that summarized my experience with most of the documentation, uh, and I found this Slack conversation, uh, a sample of it. And in most of the cases, whenever it comes to documentations, read me, what we face is we get to a point that we can read something, but it's very often misleading. It omits some facts are very often quite important. So maybe we just don't need documentation. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Uh, I mean, many of you probably had the similar exp uh, experiences with documentation, right? Misleading, misleading comments, uh, outdated wiki pages, and so on and so forth. Somebody had to write those things at some point in time. Somebody had to sit down on the computer and actually write down the documentation. And you see it a few years after, and it's useless. So does the effort we take to write this, those things actually is worth it? Like, do we actually get the return on investment uh, when it comes to the documenta technical documentation we write? So we have a few points we want to make about this. First of all, we want to know if we're solving the right problem. So basically, is solving the problem with the documentation the right, always the right choice? So basically, are there places that having more text uh, to describe something is, is really what you should do? And do we always provide this documentation the places where people will look for them. So when we were preparing this presentation, we start to looking on the context on places that we are looking for docs and the knowledge that we'd like to capture. So we've come with three areas that are worth documenting or, or we feel or we see people are documenting. So it's business and domain. What apps are actually doing, what business area we are on, this is, this is something really worth, worth knowing. Then there is this high-level architecture. Why are we using Oracle database over MySQL database, and why are we using Kafka uh, over RabbitMQ? These are valid questions that, as an engineer, I would like to know before I, before I start to com committing to, to a project. And then there is this low-level design, those core concepts within our code that has some reasons to exist, and we would like also to, to know that. And as we went through, through this presentation, and as we went through uh, trying to summarize what we think and what we know about documentation, uh, we see that, yeah, we see that these are totally different axes, and these are things that go in totally different directions, and that if we document the wrong thing in the wrong place, it's totally useless. So we would like to distinguish, to distinguish between what are we documented and how it is being documented. The one of the observations we made uh, is this. Basically, we have three... Okay, oh, here I am. Technology I won't do this. Uh, it's the first time I'm using this, and I, uh, and I won't do this anymore. So basically, we have like uh, those three, three levels of documentation, or three levels of your product, uh, have something that we call uh, decision sustainability pyramid. It's something came, named that we came up with. It's patent pending. You can always use this if you want. Only pay us like $3,000 or something. Uh, so basically, what we mean by this is that the, there is a difference between uh, change uh, the speed of changes in the, all, of the, all of the areas that we described. For example, your business and domain changes quite rarely, like maybe 
with the new direction of the company, maybe some new decisions, some pivot, of course. So this is how the business changes, but it isn't this often, right? At least comparing to the rest of those. So for example, uh, uh, High-level architecture may change regardless of the changes of the business, but mostly changes with it. But it's still like, uh, it isn't as fast as, for example, the code. So basically, you commit, to the, commit code to the repo, to your product every day. So changes in the code are extremely fast. So comparing to the business and domain or high-level architecture. For us, this means that your approach to documentation has to be different because you simply cannot apply the same principles when you document domain as when you document the code. So what can be those principles and how we can approach documenting relevant knowledge in a relevant area? You will try to walk through uh, that case by case, uh, starting with the business and domains. So whenever you start uh, working with any project, you would like to know like what's about. There's a is it an e-commerce site or is it a sport booking website or whatever? You will try to capture, uh, cap capture that knowledge. And what I would like to tell you about and describe is a, a flexible uh, format of a workshop where you can collaboratively um, explore very complex business uh, domains uh, beyond, the, uh, beyond the silos and, and uh, specialization. It's called event storming. Uh, has any of you come across event storming? I hope. Sure. Yeah, some of you at least uh, did. So event storming is uh, a session where we try to gather as many knowledge as fast as possible. We, in, we invite uh, different people from different domains for, or from different areas of our system. We get engineers, QA engineers. Uh, product owners, uh, people from finance, or whatever is relevant. And we start with a huge, gigant gigantic uh, white, uh, white board or white space, where we start to introduce sticky notes, which represent domain events. This is quite important, because whenever you try, whenever as an engineer you try to talk with business people, it's not easy to find a common language. And when the moment you start talking about things that are happening in the system, domain events, things that are relevant to business, uh, they catch it up very quickly. They, they, they are able to, uh, to communicate it and, and share the idea. So we try to capture it. The order isn't meaningful. Um, the idea, there are no bad ideas. It's a kind of a wild exploration in the beginning. So every person in the room can have stick some can stick some notes and have some have some ideas to to put on the wall. This is just just an event, just an event, and so on and so forth. And as the um, session continues, we start to move the cards, cards around. Uh, there are some more more cards introduced, different different colors. So. At some point, people start discussing wh which events are relevant or whether these two cards represent exactly the same event. It is not, uh, it's not a good idea to like, follow the discussion at this particular point in time. It is better just to flag it as a hotspot, as something worth discussing later on, something to remember, something uh, that is really important or made really a lot of fuss or caused a lot of problems and so on and so forth. So we, we mark it as a, as a hotspot. And continue. Uh, the other thing that happens is that at some point somebody starts talking in a very uh, domain-specific language. Uh, in a ver in, it might be a jargon, or it might be some terms coming from finance or whatever. It's really worth to capture it, because this is the domain language that we will be using later on in our application. And it's really good to have it captured as soon or as early as, uh, as possible. And then we continue, and we continue, and we continue. And as you can see, the cards start moving around. Uh, people have a natural tendency or natural, natural inclination to separate things that are separated. So we move things that happen over time, just separate, like away from, uh, from, from each other, and, and so on, and so on. And this starts, after a few iterations, starts to form a kind of a timeline of, our, of the processes within our, uh, within our system. Then more hotspots happen, and so on, and so forth. And at some point, we get to a situation that 
We see an event within the system like send an SMS, but or oh, SMS was sent to be precise, but we don't know who caused it. Is it. Was it caused by a user, a user registered, and then something was triggered, or there are some policies that needs to be captured within a system, so as long as somebody logs out, we have to do something else. Uh, we capture that as well in a form of a, uh, of a policy. And what we also do, we try to capture some, some users' interactions, so we put users on those screen, okay, somebody clicked or somebody entered the website, and these are events uh, that, are, uh, that are happening. So we kind of, within more or less six hours usually, can get to a fairly good overview of a system that we are going to build with a user involved, with some domain events, with some policies. So it gives us a very nice overview of what is going to happen with a system and what, is going to, what the system is going to do. Let's talk again about the language. So let's have an example. Uh, we have a domain where uh, there's a product. Product as in a, an item or a phone or something, right? So the product can be, for example, called an item in a sales pitch. It can be called inventory element in API. So you have a third name for this. It can be called inventory element item and product in the code. So you mix all of those. Uh, which uh, the problem here is that Having the same, having different words, different descriptions for the for the uh, elements in your domain, for the process and so on, creates confusion. Basically, you may feel that those things are basically the same, but there's a high chance once you start communicating that well things start to happen. By the way, this is a bubble, a very nice, very nice painting. Uh, so basically, domain experts understand things differently, programmers understand this differently, product management understand this differently than developers. Uh, this is an example from the Michal Bartizel's book, for example. We have a few different uh, f examples of how the developers call things that uh, PO or product people call it differently. So basically, for example, library is called movies list and so on. This actually creates a confusion on the product level. Basically, we do not consider the things the same, which means that our, our thinking about this is limited. So one of the huge benefits of the even storming that Kuba just described is that you actually get to have this common language. It's, a, this, it's not only a, like a dictionary of terms that you have in your domain, but it's also the processes and which are described as sentences, the words that you use, the word process, the word put into basket, and so on, those are all very important for us, all of us to understand. If, uh, oh, sorry, I actually, so if you want to uh, shine on some other conferences, it's actually called ubiquitous language. Uh, it's a term that uh, comes from domain-driven design. And basically, uh, this means that you have the, uh, all of the domain, all of the code and so on, uses the same language to describe the processes and, of course, the uh, elements in your domain. Which is very important because this means that when you talk to, for example, your product owner, you can basically show him how the API works because it, you, the API uses the same, same uh, wording as uh, all of the rest of the domain. And, of course, this also provides you with the documentation. Uh, it provides you with a description of the processes that are important to your domain. And this is very important for the next stage, which by this we mean documentation of high-level high architecture. So to document the architecture, you first, of course, have to answer the age-old question, what architecture actually is? Which, of course, if I ask around, probably get like five to ten different uh, definitions, opinions, and so on. We, are, we will use the one that we find convenient. Uh, for us, architecture is actually an answer to the question, how do you solve your business goals with, the te with technology? By which we mean, because we already described this, uh, like business goals with the processes before we started even do, thinking about this, we actually know how to, how to uh, apply, those, uh, those, uh, apply technology to processes because we have them already written down. What is important, though, for us is that we don't only want to describe 
how the architecture looks like right now. For example, the some you know diagrams on some wiki page and so on. Those are all very fine, but once you get to the, the actual issues with the code, for example, or want to uh, implement some change, you actually need to know why the decision was made. And we have some answers for this. Yeah, because one of the things that happens very often in the project, you get approach with a new person on the team, and the person asks you, okay, but why are we using this particular implementation of Java Persistent API, for example? Why are we using Eclipse Link over Hibernate? And then you just pause for a second and have this thought, yes, I remember the discussion. Yeah, it was a very good discussion. And we decided to use Eclipse Link, but I have no idea why. I just can't remember, it was so long ago. So what we're trying to do in many of the projects, we would like to have an architecture that's emerged based on constant changes within the project. We don't want to have a big blueprint architecture up front. We don't want to upfront design, but we would like to uh, let the architecture emerge. And then what we are very often missing, we do not document what has emerged, what decisions have we taken. And yeah, we have a cue for that. Uh, because we believe that architecture as is at the moment, it's, these are decisions that were taken in time in the past, and we would like to document them. And there is a tool for that, or a framework, a mental framework for that, which is called Architecture Decision Records, ADRs. It's well described, and we'll provide you uh, some links um, at the end. It was coming from uh, Michael Nagard book, Release It, from, I think, 10 years ago, more or less. And the idea is that you try to capture the discussion uh, that led you to uh, making a certain, uh, certain point or certain decision within your, within your architecture. This example is coming from an open source project. There are quite a few open source examples in that, and you can follow that as well. Uh, it's called Arcane Framework, which is a closure web framework, if, if I remember correctly. And they try to document all the framework decisions, architecture decisions, and the ADRs. So they had this concept that between different modules of their system, they have to provide some data abstraction uh, model. And they have this decision to be taken that there is data abstraction model. It has a title. Um, then this decision is valid in a certain context. So let's capture the context. Let's uh, document why are we discussing it. Uh, for example, we can discuss tabs versus spaces which is sometimes relevant, sometimes not. But then let's capture why are we talking about that. Sometimes it's bike shedding. Let's capture that it's bike shedding. But have, this, have, the, have the context. And then we will have to make a decision and document. We will be using this and this. We will provide a lightweight model for data abstraction and persistence oriented around entity attribute mode. Fair enough. And then we have the status of this decision, which is accepted. And then, most important, we have some consequences. We have some implication that will happen, or we believe at the moment that can, that can happen, that will, are very, very, very good to, uh, to line out. Okay, so ADR uh, captures the decision itself. So once it was made, you provide the context, you provide the decision made, and so on. It's very good, it's nice to have. Uh, things that we should have uh, always, but it doesn't really capture the way the decision was made. So we like to recommend you a different tool to doing actually the process before you actually start with the idea. It's called DACY. DACY is an acronym. It stands for uh, roles that are involved in the process. And as they go, it is, it is a driver. A driver is usually the person who starts this. Like the one, there has to be a decision made, right? So you need to like analyze the options, consult the right people, and once everything is, everyone agrees, you can actually create the, yeah, the ADR that Kuba just described. So driver is a person who makes all of this happen as a facilitator, right? So the person who will uh, make sure that all the right people were contacted, that the context was described, the decisions, the, the first uh, choices were described properly, and sets the due date for this. It's usually like two or three days. Uh, and basically makes sure that uh, things happen as, they, as they're supposed to. Um, 
The next role, also very important, like the most important probably, is an approver. And there's an important uh, thing, uh, important reason why there's a si this is a singular form. So, if you can, you always should have a, like a single person who approves something because if you have more, you, there's a high chance that those two people will not agree with, with each other. So, single approver is quite necessary, and this is the person who can like you know take you this giant green stamp and put it approved on the on the decision on the some some choice that sh that you proposed uh, to the other role is contributors basically contributors are people who will either implement the deci the decision we made for example the new soft or the new uh, algorithm or something uh, the, those are also the people who commit to the uh, available choices the people who actually like for example propose something and so on uh, in the, in the reality, it's mostly like the team that works on something. And the last row, which is also important, but uh, more like a, for your information part, are the uh, informed. Basically, informed are the people who will not directly uh, work on this, are like now not influencing the actual outcome, but for example, will be using an API you just design, designed. Uh, so how it does this work in practice? Uh, you actually create a page, basically. If you have a confluence, for example, it actually has comes with a pre. Uh, well, it comes with a template called Daisy. So if you use this, you are quite easy. But it's not really really complicated, so you can do it basically on everything, even a sheet of paper. Uh, in confluence, it looks like this. This is basically a table that describes uh, some options. Before this table, you should have like context of the decision. So basically, create a page that contains every uh, like most important information so people who know more or less about the project but are not inside of the main loop of this uh, of this uh, project uh, will know how this uh, how does this work and basically since effect of the days is adr you should provide it anyway so context should be there every option you have should have like uh, should have analysis of pros and cons. So you should have like this uh, areas you're interested in, uh, like deployment, like maintainability of the feature and so on. And you should be able to, uh, to provide some, uh, some pros and cons for every option. And the important thing is that thing that you should always do, always consider the do nothing option. So basically, when you're deciding upon something, always think about what will happen if no decision will be made. Like, we won't change anything. What will happen then? This is quite important for the, because we are, we tend to like doing new stuff, and we tend not to think about what will happen if we just didn't do it, right? And it's always some. It's quite quite often a viable choice to make. Okay, so we covered. Uh, Two thirds of our of our areas that we wanted to discuss, right? So we talked about the domain. You know, you know that we should put quite a lot of effort to documenting our processes, our uh, dictionary. Basically, have a place that describes quite well how does this work. Because the speed of change in domain on domain level is low, you are, you are able to actually do this quite uh, quite uh, specifically. Um, and keep up with the change. Architecture is a little bit harder because if you think about it, using ADRs and using DAC, is those elements are immutable. You, you don't change ADR once it was made because it was made at this specific point in time. So you won't be, you shouldn't modify this specific ADR. You can create a new one which will supersede this, the previous decision, but the old one will be still there. Which means that basically you get your first first limitations because of the speed of the changes. So you actually have to create, uh, find out which ADR is the most relevant one. Uh, and this is because the ch speed of change is, is faster than the domain. So, in code perspective, things actually get a little bit more tricky. There are a few problems we have when, at least I came across them, when uh, trying to document the code. And the main issues that we found, is, for example, one thing I always get is outdated wiki pages. Somebody took an effort to describe some algorithm, some process of uh, running something, 
And let's be honest, in like f at least half of the cases, those pages are simply outdated. The, once you get over the pages which won't provide you the information, you have to actually find the information in the company. So, like I said before, if you're lucky, there is a shaman, uh, sometimes called an architect, which will know everything, or know people who know everything, and will guide you. But in often, more often than not, you have to just go to the, this chain of one people to the next, and so on and so on, until you get where you wanted to go. And of course, there's uh, something you always have when you start actually coding, is the design that doesn't make sense. Like, you can understand why things were done this way and not the other. So in our case, if we actually have, uh, took our effort to document those decisions in the higher level, the architectural level, this actually will not happen that often, because we will be able to get to the actual decision. It will not be in the code, but it will be quite, quite close and always available. So, like I said before, there is a reason why the documentation that pertains to the code is, has these issues. The real issue with all of this is actually a speed. So basically because we commit code like basically every day, we are not able to document the process precisely. It's like a, something like un uncertainty principle. So basically, if you want to have a precise documentation of the code, you would have to slow the de development down so much that you actually get the precise, precise description, but like I said, it will slow down the development. But if you leave it be as it is, you won't get the precise documentation. And that's okay, because we took an effort in the previous stages, the decisions, the documentation of the code is not that important. Does it mean we shouldn't uh, document it at all? Well, code itself, maybe not. I would say that APIs, the like entry levels to your uh, libraries, to your modules, and so on, those things, that would be nice to have some documentation, but I wouldn't like bother with going through every class and so on, because it simply, it simply won't hold up to the test of time. What we can do instead of like having a, uh, this documentation. Well, those are basically principles of clean code. So I think everybody here knows clean code, right? So everybody's clean coding this way already. But if you aren't, let's do a little bit of a refresher. So one thing that really helps when, when trying to understand the code is discoverability. It's also called uh, uh, Fluent APIs. You have an example here for, uh, for the uh, library called Jog created by Lucas Eder, it says, uh, if you know SQL, you will understand what happens here. You don't need a, a single shred of documentation to understand what is happening here, right? If you know SQL, and everybody knows SQL. Uh, discoverability is one thing. Uh, it uses a mechanism that's uh, called uh, recognition. Basically, UX people already know this for quite a few years. Recognition is when you walk down the street and you see some person and you, th and you start thinking, I know this guy. Uh, recall is this moment in your discussion when you're trying to recall his name. So basically, uh, uh, discoverable APIs, uh, plus our, our uh, IDEs like IntelliJ, uh, help us to make our coding easier. For example, you know that there is a stream has something like collect, you type collect, and it shows you the available options. You don't have to remember all of the, all of the versions of the collect or the map or so on, or the parameters. It will just be there because your API provides this and you have, you have more or less of recognition of the, of the process. So discoverability is nice. It's not the only thing. Uh, the huge benefit to discoverability are the types. So basically, this means that you don't even have to have a uh, statically typed language. But if you have types, you can use them to document the parameters, for, for example, the, uh, the return values, and so on. So this is quite a bit of an issue in, in quite a lot of code, because we tend to use something like this. So the first uh, line here is the example of the, well, it looks better in IntelliJ because there's those parameter hints uh, can, you can show, but uh, it's very hard to determine what the actual parameters here are. The second uh, example uses the Fluent API, 
which describes it quite well. So we don't have to actually uh, remember all the parameters because they will be described quite, quite nicely. Uh, that's called stringer type. I don't know who came up with this, but I, I love the name. Of course, it doesn't have to be a string to actually have the same issue. Example from region matches. That would be amazing if there's a person here who actually knows all the, those parameters, what they mean. Um, it is quite complicated. So, discoverability is better. Simplicity also is better. Uh, by this, I mean if you, this is not the actual example from any library, but if you know JDBC, you know that there are, like, the initiation of the connection looks more or less like this. So, again, you won't be able to determine what, what is with what. And this means that you have to understate, understand quite, quite a lot of things before you actually start developing some library, using some library. Uh, so, it always helps to, have to spend some time and provide an easy way in. For example, the second, second version allows you just quickly set up this, the thing and start testing it, start discovering th this. And once you actually need some different things, like uh, change, uh, change uh, administration password or the protocol and so on, you can then find it because you already know like, the basis of this. Of course, there's an issue with this. Simplicity is not simple. Basically, you have to uh, uh, take some time to actually understand what is happening here, this, what, how the users will interact with your code to make it uh, so easy that they will not under, need the documentation for this. Another thing, consistency is also a thing that you should strive for. For example, your API should always use the same parameters for the same things and always name this as the... Uh, uh, as it was naming things before. So this is an example that Kuba showed in the beginning. Basically, something that I, it's not obvious what then compose then up, and then apply does, but it does the same thing as map and flatman, basically. So we got a little bit into bashing Java API. Sorry for that. I hope no offense. But you can see that there is this consistency around um, APIs. And we can use the, the idea of consistency even further. Because, as, as Visco showed, uh, certain things are, should be in certain places and we just expect them, or after some time we, we, just, uh, we just assume they, they are there. And we can take it slightly to a higher level of not just coding examples, but, but also architecture. When you deploy your application in, in, your, in your system, uh, let's call it registration service for your American corporation uh, doing multiple, multiple things. So once you deploy it, or why, once you're building it, uh, you have it in some repository on GitHub or GitLab. It's ACMA registration. You see there's this name coming, coming for. Then when you deploy the production, it's under a certain URL which also carries this registration, uh, registration name. And if we stick to, the, to those conventions, certain things are just easier and we don't have to recall them from memory. They are just where, where we expect them. Uh, we can use Swagger to document the API. Uh, regardless whether we think it's a good idea to use Swagger or not, that's not a, a point for, to, to, to make at the moment. There's a single URL that Swagger always exists. And once we deploy it to always the same URL, uh, there is, by convention, a URL for Swagger. And if all the services use Swagger, that, there it is. And then if we do traces and we do Zipkin, which is fairly recommended, uh, we have Zipkin traces in a very single, in a very, uh, in a place that we can expect it. It's always by the name. And then if we do metrics and Grafana, there is Grafana instance and the metrics are, are there and so on and so forth. We can go, we're going to go on. If in our repository there is a readme file, it may contain a section called context, which describes the purpose of the service. And we just go to certain places that we know exist and we find the right information in the, right, uh, in the right place. And we can go on further. We can use conventions to, for example, derive a state of upstream dependencies, not from the things, but from the st status of their circuit breakers, and so on and so forth. What we are living up to 
I believe, is a certain user experience of, of documentation. Um, we have this hate-love relationship towards documentation because we very often really need it, and then we found it's not relevant anymore. Because we are not looking for the documentation from the user perspective. And the user are people who will be reading it. So if we take a look on any usability slash user experience side or principles, there is a bunch of things we could learn from. And if we go to usability one-on-one, -on -one, so the basics, things are usable when uh, they are learn learnable, when they are made efficient, they are memorable, they are they prevent you from making errors in the future, and they are satisfactory for you. So we made an acronym. It's called LEMAS. And whenever you're building any part of the documentation, you can ask yourself, is it LEMAS? And for the business domain, for example, the, the, the main cause for documenting the business domain is about learnability, because if we do it right, people who will be working with us will stop asking questions again and again and again, uh, asking why are we doing these things, or what's the reason uh, of what we are building. And it is satisfactory, because people will know why they are building something. I can't believe there is a worse thing for an engineer to have his, if somebody ask what you're doing, or what's, your, what's the role, or what's the purpose of your job. They say, well, I convert one XML into another XML and send it over the pipe. Why? I don't know, I just convert it. And there are people who have this kind of job. And documenting, capturing this high-level knowledge gives them satisfactory, because it's far better to say, well, I do this conversion of the flight's notums from one system to another because it's important for airports, and that's, that's meaningful. When you come to decision and recording high-level architecture, it's about being efficient, knowing what's your stack and knowing why the stack looks the way or another. And about memorability, that I know, I remember, I, I just learned that we are building things the way we're built. So, just a question always to answer. Is it lemmas? Whenever you write any, any doc. Thank you very much. If it's of any interest to you, we have some links to follow. Uh, and we are always eager to take questions. So if you have any questions, I think we have five more minutes uh, to take. Thank you very much. <laughs> Somebody turn. Uh, uh, can we ask back for this slide? Can we have Thank you very much. There's a link for that. So, um, any questions? Uh, if you're too shy to ask the question, we'll be There's here. There's lunch right now, so I don't think so. Yeah, <laughs> damn it. It's, ha it's hard to compete with lunch. Yeah, I, I, I actually wanted to go. Like, uh, there will be a queue, so don't rush. <laughs> I have a question, one question. Sure. Okay. So what is this your strategy to deal with the uh, overwhelming uh, information which is not relevant anymore, but, but there are some pieces which gather this uh, knowledge of elders? Okay, is, is, is this, this the 700 pages anyhow structurized, or is it just no. a big of bar? Of course, <laughs> there is. Okay.
Uh, I think it will have different answers. Zbyszko will tell you in a second about full text searches, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's his uh, uh, idea, <laughs> uh, exper uh, ex uh, expertise. But uh, what I believe is I will refer back to the user experience. There is a, a, a niche or a user experience sector. There are people who, call, there are, who are called information architects. They, are, they used to be librarians and they have very good knowledge how to catalog things. And I think I will start with something like that, trying to build a structure uh, around it, a structure, uh, whatever structure, uh, coming from any given architecture framework. For example, let it be um, like C4 model, so context, uh, com containers, components, and classes, or maybe, maybe whether it be uh, ARC 42 or whatever, any, any framework that gives you a certain structure, and then try to find the relevant documents and attach it to a structure. So you go, we are dealing with um, architecture and this bit, and then make some efforts to, to find it and try to structure it. Uh, what I see in, in a company I work in, that once somebody starts doing it, people notice that it's actually not that hard and uh, start to, to help you in a, in a way that there are different people knowing different things about those 700 pages. And if you just, every time you look for, it, for something, you add it to the structure, after a few weeks, you will have a basics. And then I would validate the basic with a newcomer to a, to a company. If you have a new, new person on the team, I will give them that structure and say, okay, sit down, read it through, and tell whether it's relevant. And they will tell you if the effort is, is any, any, any good. I believe it will be, but if somebody tells you, no, it's still not relevant, I will just throw it away. So because there is the, the worst thing than uh, no documentation is existing documentation, but that's misleading or in, incomplete. Yeah. So basically, if you have 700 pages, I would say kill it with fire. Like basically, what we are doing right now is, uh, it makes no sense to fix something like this. Like, I would rather find a person who would uh, extract the relevant information, create something new, remove the rest one, like archive or something, and follow the patterns we described. So after you have this baseline, this documentation, the actual architecture right now, then follow with the ADRs. So those have a much less chance of being outdated because they are like placed in some context. So they are relevant in this context alone, and you will always know this. So I wouldn't fix 700 pages of documentation. And for the future, uh, one should always remember that to, to verify or think about usefulness of the things that you're adding. It's very easy to add pages to Confluence or any other wiki pages and so on, but uh, it's always nice to think, will this page be relevant in like a month or a year or something? It will be confusing for somebody else. So uh, we actually structure it like this. We have actually pages for, for meetings, for example, and there are like those meeting, uh, minute, the, the minutes, the meeting notes, it's uh, something that uh, has this place there and it was always, it's relevant for this purpose alone. Uh, we are starting actually in my current company with uh, DACES, uh, which serves a similar role of ADS, which they're describing the decisions itself. We actually started writing also something uh, similar to ADRs uh, in the new, new project. So, yeah, basically start with some baseline, remove what you have right now because it will not be useful for anybody, and continue with ADRs. That would be my advice. Ho ho hope that answered your concern. Did, you, did it? <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's, that's true. That's always, the, 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 that's this always, uh, session is definitely okay, too short. Uh, any other questions? Oh, there's one. Of course, of course, yes. The people, the documentation uh, as it uh, happens here is made by developers. I don't know what's the structure in your company if uh, developers actually make the decisions uh, based, but the person who makes the decisions, like propose the decisions, should write it down because this is a person who has the largest understanding of this. I don't think that having like a person, like architect who always write everything down makes a lot of sense. Like, uh, unless you want to work at a place where there's like a man in charge and you just uh, scribble things on, the on your keyboard. But if it's not the case, 
uh, everybody should join in the effort. Like, it shouldn't be just one person. You can review this with like, information architects, for example, but you should be the person who writes it. If you're referring to technical writers at the moment, uh, we, uh, at the moment we don't have such problems because we, we, we provide a product and we don't have technical audience to read the documentation. But in the previous um, company I work with, we had technical writers and they were responsible for the uh, customer provided documentation. So mm -hmm. whenever there was a piece of an API that had to make an official document, then the, the uh, technical writer kicked in, and he was working on the top of documentation prepared yeah, by the If you mean the documentation that you use as developers, it's definitely something that you should uh, be writing by developers. Another question is, it's easy to write documentation. It's like, yeah, we finished it, let's write it. Yeah, you did it. But after a year, you realize that nobody updated it. How do you deal with it? Well, actually, uh, ADRs are like a solution for this from our perspective. You, uh, I see an effort of writing down the complete documentation as a waste of time, to be honest. Like, uh, just like you said, you have no, no uh, reason to believe that anybody will read it through, uh, throughout. The, you should have some baseline if you didn't have ADRs before, but after this, write down the decisions. Like, basically, what we mean is make documenting a part of the process. So if you, you need to make some decisions, right? To make them, use ADRs and DACs. Basically use them and they will, uh, they will document by itself. So this is a thing that is, has this place in time. You may change the decision later, but you don't change the ADR, you create a new one, which supersedes the previous one with some link probably. But uh, it's a documentation. It's something that's already, uh, already prepared and is prepared uh, during the decision-making process. So it's a, it is a part of a process which means that you don't actually write documentation. You just do your job, right? Make the decision, and this is how you do it. And because you do, did it this way, you have the documentation already done. I think, I think we have to wrap it up because that would be a nice lighting dog. That's, that's a myth. That nobody ever said that, and it's a hoax. <laughs> you found it, this quote on the internet, and it's not relevant. <laughs>